slice of uh, uh, Chinese America. Uh, and the reason why I, the title is Chinese America on my mind is actually borrowed from a, uh, an exhibit on Harlem. It's called Harlem on my mind, which was a 1968. It's the first time that right. that's when I was born. Yeah. Do you want to start recording? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tell me about it. Let's yeah, sit down. Yeah. I'll turn this off. Sorry. Yeah, we can just mute it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to put the chair right in front of your thing yeah, here? Yeah, or one, yeah. Or else, like, mid the wall? Uh, the wall well, if you put the chair around here, uh, you get a lot of photographs yeah. you know, in back and also in the foreground. Okay. Yeah, you want to pull up a chair so you can sit down? I'm good. Yeah, you're good? Is the other audio from the going to affect the sound quality? A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. So maybe we just lower it or. Push it actually. Yeah, let's move that one closer to you. Okay. Yeah, because you don't have a lavalier mics. Yeah, I was looking for the one. I, I got one a while ago and I couldn't find it. Whatever. Did you meet uh, Jennifer who was here? I think she was here opening night. Yeah, he, she was here opening night. I'm gonna talk to her. Yeah, she, she's got like 13 years of footage and... Oh, wow. Um, she kind of did the same thing as you did? Well, uh, she wanted to uh, see copies of some of these photographs that... Uh, is it too much reflection off of... Uh, yeah. I, I can move. I can move these photographs. This is kind of interesting. Tilt it a little, little bit. Yeah, because you can yeah. see like it's a black and white to this. Yeah. Oh, no, you can right. Are you saying yeah, how okay. I want? All right. Yeah. You comfortable sitting there? Yeah, I'm comfortable sitting there. I just lean back a little bit. I just Sing forward a little bit. So. Okay. Yes, first question. So, Courtney, tell us um, what inspired this exhibit. Um, I think what inspired this exhibit because I, I knew that Pearl River Mod started in 1971. Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I do this shit all the time. So, Courtney, tell us what inspired this exhibit. Uh, what inspired me about this exhibit was the fact that I knew that Pearl River Mod started in 1971. Now it's the same year I started my photography career. So uh, three weeks ago, uh, when I attended the opening, uh, I um, spoke to uh, the founders and, and Joanna as well, that I, I could do an exhibit uh, going back to 1971, which would represent 45 years. So it's uh, photographs I've taken over this time period of uh, Chinese in America, uh, from New York to Boston, to Philadelphia, San Francisco, uh, Seattle, and so forth, uh, to where the uh, Transcontinental Railroad uh, was completed 147 years ago in 1869, in which the Chinese were not included in the historic photograph to commemorate the completion of the... Uh, uh, it was the major engineering feat of the 19th century for America. It would be equivalent to uh, building the uh, Suez Canal or the Panama Canal uh, years later. Now you must have hundreds of thousands of images. <laughs> um, how many do you have and how did you whittle it down to 61? Uh, well, uh, I've often been asked if I have a million photographs because that's a nice easy number. And uh, I've been asked so often about that, I. I I figure out that uh, if I took like 200 photographs every week for the last 45 years, it doesn't come to a, a million. It's like about 800,000. So and 800 is actually a pretty good number for, for Chinese. So I tell them it's, you know, just I have to continue photographing for maybe another 10 more years before I get to a million. But uh, these were photographs that were in the, the back uh, roads of my mind 
uh, that I like for one reason or another. Uh, a number of the photographs are actually in color slides, so I never exhibit them or, or printed them uh, for this. And, and originally I figured I can put up like 40 or 48. Uh, eventually I printed like uh, close to 80 uh, photographs. And after laying them down before we uh, put them up on the walls, I, I said to myself, oh, yeah, this doesn't work uh, for this reason or that reason. It, it's too dark. It's, you know, it doesn't you know, uh, grab your attention. So uh, I basically uh, withdrew probably uh, two dozen photographs. Uh, and then also I ran out of room. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, but uh, the earliest photograph starts in 1971. And the same year that the store opened, uh, I bought my first camera bag. It was a canvas bag, uh, which uh, uh, Mao's calligraphy to serve the people uh, was very much ingrained in uh, my attitude about uh, serving the people. And also, uh, I'm a generation from the John F. Kennedy, where he asked in his inaugural speech, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And since my country is the USA, I utilize that and to serve the people as my uh, underlying uh, motto uh, in my photography. And I've basically uh, done that uh, pretty much. Uh, my name translated from Chinese uh, also means uh, in uh, essence to you know, sort of serve the country. Uh, it, it means uh, uh, praiseworthy of the country. And uh, that name was given to me by my grandfather who I never met. But my other brothers, uh, uh, one means to uh, serve the country, and he was drafted during the Vietnam War. And another one means justice country, and he served as a public defender in uh, Los Angeles, San Diego, and, and Riverside, California. So uh, I'm just living up to my name. <laughs> That's awesome. what, it was, what was it like when you growing up? How did you grow up? Well, uh, my parents owned a, a hand laundry. Uh, actually, at some point in the uh, early 60s, we had two uh, hand laundries, and uh, I worked in uh, both of them, and uh, the smaller satellite uh, laundry, uh, I operated for an entire summer when I was in junior high school. So I, I learned everything about uh, the hand laundry except for the financial aspects. Uh, but I was at a time uh, I had to cook for my family because my mother was in the hospital uh, for a long period of time, and then the recovery took a, a, a long, it, it was like the entire summer. So I know if uh, I was pushed, you know, I can operate a hand laundry and know what had to be done and, and so forth. And I would iron, you know, almost any garment of clothing, uh, you know, uh, that anyone has. So, uh, but I've, uh, you know, that was, you know, my, my uh, but, you know, uh, also in junior high school, I started working in my uh, cousin's uh, takeout restaurant. So I know a lot about you know takeouts and uh, ordering food, and I worked my way through uh, college a, as a busboy and a waiter. So you know I'm really cognizant of uh, the businesses and the industries that the early Chinese you know uh, were involved with, both hand laundry and, and businesses. So uh, you know I, I basically have a, I can identify with a lot of the uh, immigrant uh, uh, generation, uh, be they. Uh, coming uh, to America post-1965. Uh, my, my dad came in 1929 uh, during the time period of the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, basically as an illegal, uh, but he was drafted during the, the Second World War and wound up with uh, the Flying Tigers or the 14th Army Air Corps. And I'm uh, currently a member of the Sons of the American Legion. And of the 61 photographs, there are six photographs that have to do with the American Legion post here in Chinatown. And that was sort of a, a subconscious uh, effort on my part. But, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I think that uh, the American public or even the Chinese public uh, is not cognizant of the fact that there are Chinese who have actually fought for this country in uh, as early as the Civil War. Uh, because in my research I found out there, there were Chinese on both sides of the North and the South that uh, had fought for this country. And that was over 150 years ago. When did you first pick up a camera? Uh, I think I picked up a camera uh, a little before 1971. Uh, I got a job uh, working for Two Bridges Neighborhood Council, which is in the area just outside of Chinatown between 
the uh, Brooklyn Bridge and the Manhattan Bridge. I was a, a community organizer and I was working with uh, tenants to uh, get uh, their um, housing conditions uh, fixed by the landlord. We would uh, uh, work with the tenants and withhold rent and uh, set up an escrow account. And over a period of time, uh, gradually the uh, landlord would uh, capitulate because if you're withholding a couple of thousand dollars in rent on a monthly basis, you know, uh, the landlord uh, needs the money to pay his taxes and, and other things. So eventually they capitulate. So I took before and after photographs of, uh, and basically they were slides. And after I finished with one uh, uh, building, I would go to another one and start organizing uh, that. And, but that was also around the same time that uh, 1971 was when uh, China got recognized by the United Nations. And uh, there's a whole you know, ping pong diplomacy just before that. And by 1979, uh, the end, it was like December, uh, Jimmy Carter recognized the People's Republic of China. Uh, so that opened up a whole uh, new era. And that's uh, when the, the storefront actually began. Uh, uh, I didn't know at that time that uh, the FBI had uh, investigated or uh, interviewed uh, the founder, Mr. Chen. Uh, but uh, at that time, the FBI also investigated me because uh, during that time period, uh, I had declared myself a conscientious objector. And during that two-year uh, alternative service period, I actually got invited by China. So uh, uh, it was against the law to, for me to leave the U.S to do anything else but my civilian alternative work. But yet, since I was invited, uh, and when I told my, uh, my dad, you know, I asked him if uh, I should go, and he said, are you kidding? You know, you know, you have a chance to go back to China, my ancestral village, you should go and represent me and uh, let uh, uh, my relatives you know, uh, know that he's okay. Because any communication be between China and the United States had to go through Hong Kong. So he had to write letters and send money to relatives in Hong Kong. Then they would forward it uh, to China. And they probably took a, a percentage of the money that, that you know, he sent. So um, you know, uh, in 1972, the same year that Richard Nixon went to China, I said, hey, Richard Nixon can go, and he's not Chinese. You know, I should be able to go. But that's when the FBI you know, launched an investigation about me, uh, and they uh, when I came back, uh, you know, friends of mine told me that, oh, uh, we didn't know where you were over the summer. You know, I got a call from the FBI. They wanted to know if uh, I knew you. And you know, eventually, after I came back, I got a call from an agent of the FBI. It was at uh, right above uh, 22 Catherine Street where Pearl River began. And uh, on the second floor was the Chinatown Health Clinic. And above that was um, um, Basin Workshop. Uh, and you know, 22 Catherine Street became the epic center of the Asian American movement, or at least you know, Chinese American uh, activism in Chinatown. So I was in the health clinic, but the phone call came to me uh, from Basement Workshop. And he said, oh, this is Agent so-and-so uh, from the FBI, and I forget the name of the individual. Uh, so, and I said, oh, FBI, oh, okay, fine. So uh, when I got up there and answered the call, I said, uh, hi, this is uh, Court Lee. what can I do for you? And he said, well, this is Agent so-and-so from the FBI. And I said, oh, FBI, is that uh, uh, short for uh, full-blooded Indian? And he said, no, 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 as in Federal Bureau of Investigation. And I said, oh, oh, that FBI, oh, what can I do for you? Uh, and he said, well, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Uh, and I asked him, well, what kind of questions do you want to ask me? And he said, well, these are just routine questions. Uh, and I said, well, what's a routine question? And so I kept pressing him, and finally he said, you know, were you in uh, Denver and Salt Lake City recently? So at that point, I didn't want to answer yes because it would confirm something that he already knew. I didn't want to answer no because he thought that I might be trying to hold some information. And I, I said, you know, you know, when uh, Chinese you know, meet someone that they don't know, especially over the phone, the one thing that they do is they invite them to a uh, dim sum or lunch. So why don't I invite you to come down to Chinatown and we can meet in a public place and we can uh, have the discussion. So uh, after much uh, prodding, he, he finally agreed to uh, do that, uh, in which uh, I uh, had him uh, meet me in uh, Chatham Square, not far from where uh, you know, Pearl River was at 22 Catherine Street. So it was a designated time. 
And then I, I figured that since the FBI had uh, all our telephones bugged, I went to look for uh, three friends who all had cameras. I said, at uh, such and such time, uh, if a, uh, a non-Chinese walks up to me in a suit, that's, chances are that's the FBI agent. So I want you to photograph him, and after I develop the photographs, I will tell uh, other people that I knew that this is agent so-and-so of the FBI, uh, and that uh, you should be aware that you know, they were a asking you know, questions about anyone and everyone. Eventually, after two hours, the guy never showed up, so I wound up taking uh, my three friends with cameras to dim sum. Uh, and Mr. Chen uh, said uh, at the opening uh, that, uh, uh, you know, he wondered why you know, the FBI never followed up on that. And I said, well, they couldn't find me. Uh, I said, for Mr. Chen, they knew where he was at 22 Catherine Street. So uh, I think uh, I probably have some sort of uh, FBI file, which, uh, you know, eventually before I'm six feet under pushing up daisies, I should find out what they, what they know about me. Do you want to um, yeah, um, <clears throat> do you, I was actually wondering, like, I mean, in the context of these photos, what kind of changes have you found significant in the Chinese community? I, I think the most profound changes I've seen in the Chinese community, as well as the, the Asian American community, is there uh, 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 initially, it may have been their reluctance to uh, exercise their democratic rights, but certainly by 1971, six years after the passage of the uh, Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1965, uh, uh, Chinese you know, took to the streets, you know, that they got involved in voter registration, and I think from uh, that time period, more and more Chinese got involved in the political process. As a matter of fact, I know for a fact that in the 1960s, there were two Chinese American mayors that were mayors of small towns in the state of Mississippi. All right, uh, and that was the first time a Chinese American was elected to public office. Uh, it was, and then after that, uh, there were other Chinese. It, it took, uh, I think, for New York City, it took until about 2001, 2002, before the first Chinese American uh, city council uh, person was elected. But in Seattle, which uh, had a uh, an older Chinese American population. There was a woman named Ruby Chu. Uh, she was elected uh, shortly after uh, Wing Lu was elected. And this was like uh, late 40s, early 50s. Uh, but Wing Lu died within about six months after he was elected. But she was the first Chinese American uh, woman elected to city council in Seattle. And when she passed away, her daughter, Cheryl Chow, uh, took over her uh, city council position until she passed away a, a few years ago. But one of the things about Ruby Chow was that while she ran a restaurant, uh, she also housed Bruce Lee when he was living in Seattle that a lot of people don't know about. Okay, so and then uh, the idea, uh, I've sort of found out from the 1950s, no, definitely by the 1960s, uh, uh, Chinese running for public office would utilize fortune cookies and uh, they would put little, <clears throat> they would uh, take out the fortune uh, and they would put the stuff in like, vote for Ruby Chow. Uh, and uh, Ruby's son, Ed Chow, who passed away recently, told me that he was the first one to utilize the fortune cookies in his mother's restaurant to, to say, vote for Ruby Chow. So one of the photographs I, I have here is from 1976, from the voter registration uh, campaign for the 1976 presidential election when uh, Jimmy Carter was, was running against, uh, it was General Ford. So, and uh, the individual is holding a fortune from the fortune cookie, which reads in Chinese and in English, for better wages vote, okay? Uh, I didn't uh, want him to hold a fortune cookie because, you know, it's a little hard to hold the fortune uh, cookie and the, the fortune itself. So th there's, you know, a, a bit of humor, uh, but it, it's also, reflects on uh, the uh, fact that Chinese Americans, you know, basically want to become part and parcel of American life, uh, be it in electoral politics or, you know, in general, or, or uh, uh, reclaim their history. Uh, another photograph is the one of the Chinese who, uh, the uh, tr completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. In uh, 2014, it was the 145th anniversary. So I, I resolved um, 
going back to my days in junior high school when I, I saw that photograph, there were no Chinese in it. So I resolved, you know, uh, in 2014 that I would do something about it. And in an article that was uh, published in the uh, New York Times, uh, I said that uh, I wanted to uh, commit an act of photographic justice that was denied uh, 12,000 Chinese railroad workers uh, during that time period. And uh, in the process, uh, over 200, 200 uh, Chinese and Asian Americans showed up, uh, mostly from Salt Lake City, uh, and uh, there were like six Chinese descendants of railroad workers. You know, I didn't plan on that. I was only planning on 145 individuals, uh, one uh, representing each year that the Chinese uh, were not represented in the annual reenactment, which had been going on for about 65 years. And since then, I've been doing annual pilgrimages, uh, uh, bringing people from different parts of the country um, uh, to the uh, reenactment at the Golden Spike National Historic Site, and also to the Chinese Arch which is a natural limestone rock formation about four and a half miles where the two locomotives met. Uh, and this year I held a Buddhist ceremony to commemorate the Chinese railroad workers who, who worked and, and died uh, working on the railroad uh, between 1865 and 1869. Uh, and uh, if you uh, ever get there, if you look at the base of the natural rock formations, it's called the Chinese Arch. And it's, it's probably the only uh, natural um, uh, uh, rock formation, I guess, you know, in the U.S. that's dedicated to the Chinese and, and the railroad. Uh, you'll see fossilized fish. So uh, every year uh, since uh, 2014, I've organized an annual pilgrimage. So, and I'll continue to do this until the 150th anniversary, in which I uh, want to get the U.S. Postal Service to issue a commemorative stamp on the 150th anniversary in 2019. Uh, because you know the post office will do things uh, on the 150th you know, commemorative. You know, they did one for the Civil War at the end of the Civil War, uh, 150th you know uh, uh, year. Uh, so, but I also have a graphic artist here in New York who can probably design that because he's designed every uh, Lunar New Year's there for the last 10 years. I think you talked about your photographs. Uh, all your work in photographic activism. Um, why is that important to you? Well, I realized uh, going through college I was not a good writer. Uh, I, I can't write plays like David Henry Huang. Uh, I can't uh, direct movies or you know, uh, convince people to act in, in a film like Ang Lee or, you know. Uh, so I, I figured that, you know, if I was going to uh, make a statement about uh, my, my time on this earth, you know, uh, the best thing for me to do was uh, to utilize a camera because everyone agrees that a picture is worth a thousand words. So if I take 61 uh, photographs, I have 61,000 words to say. Uh, and when people come up, you know, I, I generally tell them, if you have any questions, I can give you the backstory uh, as well as you know, what happened uh, before and after the, the photograph was taken. So in a sense, I'm, I'm uh, writing a, a visual history. Do you remember your first camera? My first camera was a uh, screw mount uh, Pentax uh, and when they came out with a uh, bayonet mount in like 1978 I can immediately convert it to the bayonet mount because if you screw the uh, lenses uh, incorrectly you ruin the lenses. Uh, so I, I never had a, a, my own camera until I, I got to uh, China in 1972. I, I bought uh, two cameras, Pentax uh, Spotmatics in uh, Hong Kong because at that time that was the, the cheapest place to, to buy a camera. Nowadays you can go to B&H or Adorama and uh, you can beat the Hong Kong prices. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your most famous um, photograph? So um, one of your photographs is on the front page of the New York Post. Can you tell us a little bit about what you were doing on that day and how you captured that image? Well, um, the, the year before, uh, December of two, uh, 1974, there was an incident in a uh, bar called the Jade Chalet. And uh, the way I understood it was that there were two on-duty uh, plainclothes officers that came into the bar. It was you know, fairly late, you know, probably around 11, probably close to, to 12 uh, midnight. And uh, allegedly, they had said they were in there to break up uh, a gang uh, Chinese gang shakedown of the uh, bar. 
Uh, in fact, there were some alleged gang members there, but uh, they were pretty quiet. But uh, when I got there after the shooting uh, was done, because there was one fatality, uh, a bar patron uh, was killed, um, I uh, spoke to the uh, owner, and he said that there was actually a, uh, an argument between uh, uh, Bruce Lee's Kung Fu and uh, the police officer. And uh, he, he basically, the police officer said that I can kick Bruce Lee's ass, you know. And uh, the bar uh, patron uh, disagreed with him. So, the, you know, this you know, a little scuffle or you know, verbal argument got into a fist fight. And at which point, uh, the bar patron w was beating the crap out of this uh, uh, police officer who never identified himself as a police officer. But his partner uh, uh, ran out, called for backup, came back in and shot and killed uh, this bar patron and wounded a, a second one. So I heard about it uh, that morning, I, I think it was like 7 a.m. Uh, and uh, even at that time I, I would get a uh, uh, subscription for the New York Times uh, and I heard it on the radio. So I, I resolved to come down uh, to Chinatown to, to see if I can uh, get a photograph and get in. Um, and, and they had said that uh, they were there to break up uh, this uh, you know, shakedown by a, a Chinese uh, teenage gang. So I get there and uh, the uh, bar owner uh, was still there. There was a police officer standing guard and they hadn't cleaned up uh, any of the evidence. Uh, they had removed the body. Uh, so I asked the um, owner, because uh, I wasn't sure if he you know, understood you know, uh, English, so in, in my only Mandarin, I, I said, kai bu kai, and I was holding my camera. So he just waved me in, and then when I uh, heard the, the chief of uh, detectives speak to him in English, and he answered back in English, I said, oh, the guy understands English, I can speak to him. <laughs> So after the chief of detectives saw me with a camera, he asked me where my press badge was, and I didn't have a press badge. But I didn't, so I made up the story that I left a press badge in the car because I rushed over here. And then he said to me, you know, kid, if I ever see you again without your press pass, you know, I'm gonna bust you. And I said, okay, I'm sorry, um, you know, officer, I'll, I'll make sure. That so basically, I lied through my teeth so I could stay in there and then uh, take some photographs of, of the carnage. But in the photograph that I took that appeared in the New York Post in December of 1974 showed the uh, chief of detectives. I didn't know he was the chief of detectives until I got to the New York Post and processing the film. They said, hey, this guy's the chief of detectives. Oh, so that they f figured that uh, you know, was important. But the, the Post knew the name of the chief of detectives. So uh, that was my first photograph that I published. But uh, uh, the next year, in 1975, there were uh, protests about police brutality. So this is one of the incidents that had been smoldering within the Chinese community. <clears throat> so when it finally happened, uh, they were marching from <clears throat> Chinatown uh, to City Hall, which is uh, not that far away. It was about you know, 10, 15 minutes. But they had closed all the businesses in Chinatown. And I heard that they even closed the gambling halls in Chinatown so they could uh, participate in this. And they didn't reopen, the businesses didn't reopen until after the protest uh, was over. But uh, in the process, uh, the police were trying to move the crowd because they gathered in, in front of uh, one building. Uh, and the police in riot gear came out and uh, the, uh, one officer you know, swung his billy club and then there was a sort of mad scuffle. So, and I saw they were taking one person who was hit. Uh, that's what the photograph shows in the uh, New York Post. So after I took that photograph, I called up the New York Times, I called up the Daily News, and I called up the Post. Both the Times and the Daily News said, well, our photographer was on the scene, and uh, we're gonna look at uh, our stuff, okay? So the Post said that they, were, uh, they had their photographer, and they said, well, wait a minute. Uh, he never said anything about you know somebody uh, being struck and uh, bleeding because I had to describe what I had, not, not seeing you know back then they didn't have uh, any digital photography, so he said okay come on down. So from City Hall I you know back then I think I was like 22, 23 years old. I ran from City Hall all the way uh, through Chinatown to the New York Post that was on uh, South Street. I developed the photographs and and then I you know went back to the protest. And lo and behold, when I got back to City Hall, the protests were still going on. 
because uh, uh, news had filtered around the crowd that you know there was somebody who was struck on the head and they didn't know if he was arrested or, or something. Uh, so uh, at that time, that year, the Post had an afternoon edition which published the uh, Wall Street opening uh, prices. So that was the only newspaper that had a, an afternoon edition. So uh, there's uh, still a newsstand uh, right next to City Hall uh, which uh, New York Post delivered some papers. And uh, right across from there, there was a, a flatbed uh, truck, which I, I think the flatbed truck actually may have been from uh, uh, Pearl River, uh, because on the flatbed truck that they were you know, having, uh, uh, you can come in. So the, uh, they were holding uh, you know, rallies and, and uh, but uh, after the post truck uh, delivered the newspaper, somebody came up to me and says, Corky, is there another Corky Lee? Is this you? Because they saw my photo credit on the front page. And I said, yeah, that's me. And you know, that kind of clicked. And uh, I said to myself, you know, maybe this is what uh, uh, my life uh, should be from uh, this point on. Uh, and it was uh, widely circulated. Eventually, the photograph was used in a civil suit uh, for the individual, uh, so he, he sued the police department and was settled out of court. Uh, so I don't, I don't know how much uh, money he got, but uh, <clears throat> through a series of photographs, I could, you know, uh, figure out from the badge on it because every police officer had their uh, uh, their name blacked out uh, with black tape, but you could see the badge number. So from the badge number, you can tell who was in the vicinity. So they probably call these uh, officers into court and ask them basically what happened. So, you know, um, that's how the photograph uh, got in. And uh, it's, uh, you know, there are all the photographs that have been used, you know, uh, that day. And I, I found the identity of some of the individuals. Well, one fellow is uh, uh, Warren Chin, who's now a, a, a cardiologist, uh, who has a practice on Canal Street now. Uh, he has a copy of the photograph, but there are other people that I, I can identify uh, from that front page photo. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite photograph in this exhibition? Uh, I think um, the, the favorite photograph probably would be the one from the Transcontinental Railroad, because on an annual basis I, I have a pilgrimage and I organize that uh, since uh, 2014. Um, a photograph that I have not taken uh, yet would be on the 35th anniversary of Vincent Chin, who's a hate crime victim in Detroit because next year is the 35th anniversary. So there's gonna be a lot of commemorative uh, screenings of uh, the Vincent Chin documentary. There are two of them. I appeared in one of the documentaries. Uh, so what I uh, hope to do uh, next year in June would be to organize a flash mob in front of the individual who's most responsible for the wrongful death of Vincent Chin. Um, 30 years ago, or thereabouts, he was, uh, find uh, like a million dollars. But through penalties for not paying, it uh, now amounts to eight million dollars. So I, I think his uh, neighbors, you know, in the Henderson, Nevada, don't know that this guy is responsible for a hate crime. So I'm gonna um, do another act of photographic justice, and it, it would uh, probably resonate along, uh, among a lot of uh, Asian Americans, you know, at least Chinese Americans, that somebody you know, has not forgotten about Vincent Chin. So that's a photograph that will probably become uh, my next favorite. But for the time being, it would be the one of the Transcontinental Railroad, which I got uh, over 200 people, according to uh, National Public Radio, and the, the Chinese Arch. Uh, so those are two of my favorite ones, uh, because you know, I, I put a lot of effort. You know, some of the other photographs, that I can walk around Chinatown with the exception of the civil rights, you know, uh, uh, protests and demonstrations. And you can catch uh, a day in the life of uh, people in Chinatown, which, you know, uh, doesn't show up in tourist books. You know, a lot of tourists, you know, will photograph uh, various, you know, things that, that you know, uh, I find that tourists will, will photograph, you know, the ducks and the chickens hanging in the windows, you know. So when I see that, you know, because they don't see this when they go to the supermarket. Uh, but, you know, uh, I can tell what kind of photographs. Uh, and then there's also a book about the uh, lenses of Chinatown that's going to come out next year. So there are two photographs that the uh, uh, publisher uh, is considering. And I'm recruiting other uh, photographers who photograph Chinatown uh, to be in this book. 
So there are a number of uh, women photographers as well as male photographers because uh, I've you know, curated uh, at least two exhibits uh, about Chinatown. Can you tell us a little bit about the photograph of um, the group in front of the precinct? The oh, the, the yeah. Look, let me just. Can I give you a, a list of the photographs that you can? Uh, oh, sure. Thank you. There are numbers on the, the lower right hand corner. Oh, yeah, I have them behind you. Yeah, the whole nine inch show. Okay. We'll be finished with this uh, pretty soon. Um, the, the one with the fifth precinct um, actually um, uh, took place uh, at the same uh, time period uh, and the same day as the. Um, protests uh, for uh, Peter Yao, uh, uh, alleged case of police brutality. Eventually, uh, Peter Yao uh, was exonerated and all the charges against him were dropped because he had originally protested the, the treatment of, uh, that uh, stemmed from a uh, traffic accident uh, in which uh, the driver who was non-Chinese you know, uh, drove down Mott Street, turned on Baird, and pulled up in front of the 5th Precinct and then ran into the 5th Precinct. But nobody knew that at the time that he was an off-duty police officer. But he was most responsible for this uh, traffic accident. And Peter Yao was probably the most vocal and the closest to the steps of the 5th Precinct. So as, uh, using him as an example, they drew him, took him into the precinct and, and he res resisted arrest because he was arrested for resisting arrest, which is almost an oxymoron. Yeah, why would anyone want to be arrested unless it, it's a matter of civil disobedience? But he was in, arrested for inciting a riot. Uh, and uh, I forget what the third charge was, but it was, you know, um, basically drummed up. But the, when they beat him up, that they broke his eardrum. Uh, so uh, after a, a long court battle, uh, and also uh, the protests from, um, people in the neighborhood, the charge was dropped, and he was exonerated. But uh, in another photograph with the, the four guys with their arms locked, there's uh, one African-American kid, and he's got this uh, euphoric smile on his face because the African-American community had always uh, complained about police brutality. And here he is with a crowd of, you know, uh, 20,000, uh, that's the figure that I got, who, who were complaining about police brutality uh, and he can't believe that the Chinese, of, of all people, are complaining about police brutality. So aside from the, the four guys that you know, you know, make a very strong uh, photograph, uh, he, I think, is the most important figure in that photograph. So, but in the photograph in front of the 5th Precinct, there's a uh, Henry Chang, who's a um, Chinatown uh, or a Chinese American mystery writer who still lives on Mott Street. So um, he has a copy of that, so I think he's coming either today or tomorrow to see that photograph, because people have told him, hey Henry, you're in this photograph that Corky has. Last question for me. Um, do you remember Pearl River? When do you remember Pearl River from? And I remember Pearl River from um, uh, when they first opened up on 22 Catherine Street. Like I had said, uh, uh, Chinatown Health Clinic, which is now the Charles B. Wong Community Health Center, I organized a street fair that begot the health clinic. And then uh, by the time they uh, moved to um, present day Canal Street, it was called the Charles B. Wong. It was named after uh, this guy who, uh, along with uh, uh, Sanjay Gupta, uh, bought the New York Islanders hockey team. Okay. <laughs> so, and, and both of them probably never knew anything about hockey until they bought the team. Uh, but uh, I recall that uh, during uh, certain national holidays, like uh, uh, Double Ten, uh, there were goons uh, from the, the KMT that would come and, and break the windows, you know, and, and make life miserable. Uh, aside from the, the FBI, you know, coming uh, uh, periodically. Uh, but um, I bought my first camera bag there. I think, uh, other than my camera bag, uh, the camera bag actually said uh, to serve the people. Uh, but aside from the camera bag, I think uh, the other items I bought there the first time was sandalwood soap. Uh, and then there was also wax-covered uh, umbrellas, uh, which is, it seemed like everyone who watched uh, you know, the samurai movies, you know, would carry those you know, same umbrellas. You know. uh, so those are the, the, the first three items that, that I remember, you know, uh, buying. In, uh, but it, it was, you know, it was something, you know, uh, the management uh, made us uh, feel comfortable. 
uh, coming in there, and, and you know, they, they supported uh, other activities. You know, uh, I'm sure they had supported the basement workshop, uh, and it's also uh, the um, uh, Chinese American historian Peter Kwong lived in the same building. Now he's a distinguished uh, professor at uh, Hunter College, and he's written like six books about Chinese in America. Uh, and his latest book is about the Chinese Exclusion Act, which next year is the 135th anniversary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what, what do you hope that the next generation of Chinese well, Americans learns from? Well, I, I think the next advice? generation knows very little about the activism of Chinese Americans uh, stemming from the 1970s. Uh, because uh, Asian American studies is not something that's uh, universal in uh, any college that you go to. Uh, even here in New York, aside from Columbia and uh, NYU, and, and maybe a few of the CUNY colleges, they have classes, but you really can't major in Asian American studies. Uh, on the East Coast, the only uh, place that you can major in Asian American studies is uh, the University of Maryland. You know, uh, and that's like pretty far from uh, New York City. I mean, it's close enough to Washington, D.C. Uh, but on the West Coast, you know, uh, Asian American studies has is, uh, been something that they try to eliminate. But uh, as long as ethnic studies, African American studies, Latino American studies, Chicano, uh, and I think that's going to be a, a real test uh, for the um, uh, during the years of the Trump administration. I think he's going to try to do away with all that. And I think the person who's nominated for the Department of Education is, is not very cognizant of uh, that. So, uh, I mean, it's just another battle we'll have to go through. Where does that take your photography? <laughs> well, yeah, I'll probably continue to, to do this. Uh, at this point, uh, I'm uh, of uh, AARP, you know, age, uh, and I'm hoping that in another year I can collect my full Social Security benefits, uh, which means that uh, every year that you wait after 66, you get 8%. So no bank is going to give you 32% when you hit 70. Uh, but I, I think I'll continue to do this uh, for as long as I can. Uh, it, uh, you know, uh, my back holds up, my knees hold up, and so forth. But that's why on the 150th anniversary of the Transcontinental Railroad, I'm going to turn it over to somebody else, you know, and, you know, let somebody else, uh, you know, take it on from there. That's a good way to end. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Thank you. Yeah. There's a lot of good stuff. Yeah. Did you have any questions? Um, yeah, no, I sort of just eased out, right? When you you want to ask?